guide it safely back to Earth. They were known as the flying bathtubs. For the first test, the M2F1 was towed behind a car, souped up Pontiac. Whitey Whitesides drove that Pontiac across the lake bed at about 120 miles per hour, dragging this flying bathtub behind it. As well as groundbreaking, their tests could also prove ground shaking. The X-24B, a lifting body with wings, was the first such craft to land on an actual runway, as all shuttles would eventually do. Early on, the space shuttle was going to have jet engines to return for a horizontal landing, much like an airliner. The X-15 had proven fairly specifically that they could make horizontal landings very accurately, unpowered, flying a steep glide slope, that they could do a horizontal, uh, unpowered landing with the shuttle. As they tried to narrow its size, shape, and weight, engineers also considered how this new orbiter would be propelled safely out of the reach of Earth's gravity. At the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, home of the rockets that had sent every Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo astronaut into space. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Design teams would devise the partially reusable propulsion system that would finally be adopted. The main engines were always something we paid very close attention to. Lots of moving parts, lots of, lots of uh, high energy in very tight places and very cold liquid on one side of a very small wall and very hot on the other side. When that thing finally lit off, for me, it just showed the power of a space shuttle main engine in, and then there's three on the back of an orbiter and then there's the two solid rocket motors. Um, that was probably the, the spark that, that got me so interested in the space shuttle program in general and, and what it took to actually get one engine to light, much less three and two boosters uh, to take the shuttle to orbit. As for the orbiter, spiraling costs forced NASA to abandon equipping it with its own jet engines and escape pod. Originally it was gonna be an air breathing uh, airplane that would fly to space as a rocket and then come back to Earth. The orbital maneuvering system pods that sit on the back now were to be where deployable air breathing engines would come out and it would be able to fly from uh, its intended point of landing to another place if the weather were bad or something like that. NASA's new shuttle would essentially glide its way back to Earth. Producing the components of this new space transportation system fell to familiar names in the space industry. Prime contractor Rockwell North American, now Boeing, had built the Apollo Command Service Module. Morton Thiokol, now ATK, would build the solid rocket boosters, and Martin Marietta, now Lockheed Martin, would construct the ET. Responsibility for producing the space shuttle's main engines went to Rocketdyne, now Pratt Whitney. There was a lot of teamwork that was going on. It was bringing people from all across the country, from Kennedy, from Johnson, from Marshall. So many people involved that had to have worked together. Now, at the beginning, there was a lot of anxiety that we weren't going to work together. But when people got to know each other and could trust each other, that's when the work began. It was uh, an amazing vehicle, and in a lot of ways, way ahead of its time to have a reusable spacecraft they could carry such tremendous amounts of, of uh, cargo to, uh, to space uh, was unprecedented. September 1976, more than four and a half years after President Nixon signed off on its development, America's new spacecraft, Constitution, gets its first close-up before the cameras. The orbiter itself was well received by the public, but impassioned fans of a particular long-canceled television series called Star Trek wanted it called something else. They staged a successful write-in campaign and the orbiter was renamed for the Starship featured on the show. Thus, NASA's new shuttle would be the Enterprise, boldly going as no spacecraft had ever gone before. Whatever its name, this bird still needed to prove it could fly.
In an age before computer simulations, balsa wood models and wind tunnel testing was the only means to test the airliner-sized glider. We put together a very aggressive uh, flight test profile that consisted of data points continuously all the way down. There were just not there was not a, a matter of ten seconds went by without another either pitch doublet or a rudder kick or an angle of attack sweep. Uh, the things that really turn on a test pilot to fly them as accurately as possible. August 12, 1977. On a crystal clear California morning, high above the Mojave Desert, two NASA test pilots ready for Enterprise's first flight. The plan was for Fred Hayes, Jr. and Gordon Fullerton to lift the orbiter off a modified 747, then land on a dry lake bed 15,000 feet below. The thing that uh, we were most concerned about was if we were going to be able to get to a launch speed, if uh, Fitz Fulton was going to be able to put the 747 into a slight dive so that we would have enough lift on the uh, Enterprise to, when we did push the separation button, blow the bolts to lift away from the airplane without hitting Fitz's tail. And of course, both of us were interested in, 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 uh, in that happening. The pilots on the 747, Fitz Fulton and Tom McMurtry, sit and wait for the command to release and steer their massive aircraft out from under Enterprise. There were still questions about was it going to actually uh, happen uh, as we expected from those simulations and the analysis and everything. Uh, there's a very loud thump when the shuttle separates. There was always a question was the shuttle going to slide back and hit the tail of the 747. But uh, we couldn't see that, but uh, we could, after a few seconds, we could tell it didn't hit us and so the chase called clear. Once we reached the 240 knots and Fitz called on speed, I think he really pushed some of the sensors he was looking at in order to let us get to there, but, and we appreciated that. But once, once we heard Fitz say on speed, um, I pushed the separation button and we, we just broke free. We had about one and a half Gs of lift. Honestly, that was probably the most exciting moment in the approach and landing test, to feel and be there when the shuttle separated from the 747. By all accounts, this first freefall test is a success. Five weeks later, Enterprise is brought to 22,000 feet for her second freefall test. Pilots Joe Engel and Dick Truly have only two minutes to capture flight and maneuvering data before landing the aircraft again without any engine. It was a real team effort, and the challenge was for Dick Trulli and I to fly that profile and fly those data points, uh, those maneuvers, as precisely as possible to give them the best data possible. It was, it was a test pilot's dream. A total of 16 taxi, captive, and drop tests confirmed the soundness of the craft's design and green-lighted production of the first space-worthy orbit. Columbia, NASA's first orbiter, is fittingly named after the first American vessel to circumnavigate the globe. However, Columbia quickly becomes a daunting challenge for NASA. Its complex makeup had engineers struggling constantly to reduce Columbia's weight and simplify construction. Especially frustrating was keeping the orbiter's ceramic tiles attached to its fuselage, more than 25,000 of them fit together to protect Columbia from the searing 3,000 degree heat of re-entry. We were having a lot of problems with the thermal protection system of the tiles. Uh, the way we were trying to glue them on, they wouldn't, wouldn't stay on. And we had to come up with a way of making sure that they'd stay on. And we had some really great people that worked that, and that's why it took such a long time. I had hoped it was not going to take that long since uh, John and I were named as a crew, so we had a lot more time to train than what I had <laughs> we'd both initially planned. The requirement was to be able to handle temperatures like 2500 degrees F that occur on the surface of the, of the TPS, and that's five times what your oven is at, at home that you bake cookies under at max. 
The other problem is weight, because after all, this is an airplane, so you can't have a metallic system on it that weighs tons. It has to be extremely lightweight. And in fact, the shuttle tiles are about 90% air, and th that gives the combination of being able to be temperature resistant and yet at the same time light. Each orbiter has a unique number of protective tiles. Challenger was built with the most, 31,088, while Atlantis has the fewest, a mere 24,177. Over in Palmdale, they had put on their first effort of putting the, the tiles on to protect the aluminum from the heating they were going to get on re-entry. And some of those tiles, when they put them on in the daytime, next morning the tiles were on the hangar floor. And so that was real scary that they could lose some tiles while they were on orbit and really have a problem with the heat coming back on re-entry. Columbia had a lot of tiles missing yet, uh, needed quite a bit of work before we could deliver it to the Cape. And uh, we scrounged throughout the city of Lancaster for uh, RTV, which was the, the material we used to glue the tiles on with. More glue did keep the tiles in place. However, water was literally ripping them apart. It turns out, in the instant we hit rain, the tiles almost exploded. The tiles fabrication process was modified and the problem overcome. Other shuttle design features proved less problematic and more groundbreaking. A computerized digital flight control system, now common in commercial and military aircraft, was developed for the orbiter. In flying the space shuttle, you were so aware that you weren't necessarily talking to the shuttle, you were talking to a computer who in turn was going to talk to the, to the shuttle. Barriers of race and gender were falling everywhere, and America's core of shuttle astronauts would become more reflective of the nation it served. There's been a lot that's, that the shuttle era has done to bring uh, spaceflight into, into the, the domain of, of the average person. We know it's not just crew cut white test pilots anymore. It's, it's the, essentially the United Nations that flies on the space shuttles. It's, it's people of every description that look very much like the rest of us. The astronaut selection process reflected a changing nation and a changing NASA. At the time, all the astronauts were military test pilots and there were no females. So it was kind of like one of those dreams that you hope will happen someday, but you didn't really think would. The NASA astronaut class of 1978, the largest in the agency's history came from all walks of American life. Physicists, meteorologists, fighter pilots, scientists, and for the first time, women and African Americans. When I came into the astronaut program in 78, uh, there were three African Americans that came in at the same time. And it was the first time that NASA had hired African Americans. We had Fred Gregory, who was a test pilot, and then two, Ron McNair, who was a mission specialist, and I came in as a mission specialist. So all three of us were excited about uh, flying in space, and we all, all three of us recognized that we were really going to open up the envelope for other African Americans to fly in space. While the new class of NASA astronauts trained for subsequent shuttle flights, Columbia was undergoing preparations for the program's maiden voyage, STS-1. Veteran astronaut John Young, one of the 12 men to set foot on the moon, is in command. His pilot is first-time flyer Bob Crippen. To be sitting on board up there with my buddy John Young uh, and get to experience the whole thing from ascent and being on orbit to flying re-entry, uh, it uh, was one of the high points of my career. Together they would travel over a million miles and circle the Earth 36 times. The launch finally occurred. We'd been waiting and postponing and postponing and, and uh, when it finally lifted off and we knew it was going and, and achieved orbit, uh, we were all in anxious anticipation for what was going to happen next. Launched like a rocket two days earlier, Columbia lands as a glider on the dry lake bed of Edwards Air Force Base. 